Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me speak at this forum. Um, today, I'm going to talk about open scholarship. And the subtitle of my talk is Where are the self-correcting mechanisms of science? And I'm going to argue that openness and transparency are fundamental to making science live up to its reputation for valuing self-correction. So we know from research in the US, the Pew uh, survey, that public trust in science is consistently very high. In, this, uh, in these results, the public trust in scientists are the green bars. And you can see from 2016 through 2019, the public trust in scientists is quite high. Around 80% of Americans say that they trust scientists at least somewhat, a fair amount or a great deal. And that's higher than public trust in most other institutions. So we know that Americans trust science and trust scientists quite a bit. But another interesting thing in the Pew survey is that Americans are not naive about what scientists are like. When the Pew researchers asked Americans about their views about research scientists in medicine, nutrition, and environmental science, and they asked specifically, do you think that research scientists in these domains provide fair and accurate information, are transparent about conflicts of interest, or my favorite, admit and take responsibility for mistakes, the proportion of respondents who say yes is actually quite low. So that's the green dots in these results. So around 10 to 15% of Americans say that research scientists in these domains admit and take responsibility for mistakes. So why do they trust scientists if they, don't, they aren't deluded that scientists are these noble creatures that always tell the truth and are always accurate and fair and take responsibility for their mistakes? Well, one answer to that question of why do people trust science um, is that the trust in science doesn't come from individuals, individual scientists being noble. And Don Campbell, a psychologist, said this well. He said, the resulting dependability of reports comes from a social process rather than from dependence upon the honesty and competence of any single experimenter. He said, organized distrust produces trustworthy reports. So it's this social phenomenon, this community that values checking each other and that doesn't just automatically trust each other, but actually has this organized skepticism or organized distrust of each other. And that's what makes science trustworthy. And actually this phrase organized distrust comes from a sociologist of science, Robert Merton, who wrote in the 1940s. And he talked about the core values or norms in science. And he said that there are four values that kind of define what it means to be a scientist. And he was talking about this social process. What, what makes a community of scientists bind together? It's their shared values. And specifically, he think, thought that there were these four values at the center of it. So I'm gonna go through them very quickly. The, the first one is the idea of universalism, which is the idea that the validity of a scientific claim doesn't depend on who's making it. It doesn't matter if it's a Harvard scientist or a graduate student or somebody from another country. Um, we evaluate the validity of the claim on its own merits. Um, so status shouldn't matter, hierarchy shouldn't matter. This is obviously important for self-correction because if we don't have this principle and this value, then the most elite, most eminent scientists will never get corrected when they make mistakes. The second value that Merton talked about was communality or he called it communism. And this is the closest to the core of open science. It's the idea that the findings of science belong to everyone. They're not private property. So open communication is key. There should not be secrecy. And of course, you can also, also see why this is important to self-correction, right? If we don't put things out in the open, if we don't show our work, then we're not gonna find the errors. And I'll come back to this idea. The third value, talk, the value that Merton talked about was disinterestedness. And this is the idea that scientists should be focused on finding the truth, not on their own success. So self-interest shouldn't factor in. You should report whatever you find, even if it makes you look bad. This is probably the most controversial of his norms and many um, philosophers and sociologists and historians of science actually argue that we don't need individual scientists to be disinterested. But I think one thing that most scientists do agree on is that the self-interest of the individual scientist is not what's important to the community. So if criticizing a scientist means that you might hurt their financial gains, that's okay. We're not gonna prioritize their own self-interest. We're gonna prioritize finding the truth, at least at the community level. And then the fourth norm, and you can see why that's also important for self-correction, because sometimes correcting things is going to hurt people's reputations or financial opportunities and so on. The fourth norm is organized skepticism or organized distrust. And this is the idea that we don't take things at face value and we don't ask other scientists to take our claims at face value. We expect others to want to verify our claims. That's normal. That's acceptable. Um, and nothing is sacred. So no matter what I say, no matter how much I want to believe someone's claim or it aligns with my moral or political or religious values, I'm still allowed to challenge it. 
and that's still okay. There's nothing that's beyond criticism or verification. And obviously that's also very important for identifying mistakes and fixing them. Um, a relatively recent survey, 2007, of um, scientists asks, asked these scientists, do you subscribe to these norms? So they describe them in plainer language, like the idea of sharing everything for communalism or the idea that claims should be evaluated on their own merits for universalism. Um, and the top two bars show the gray part of the bar is the proportion of scientists who endorse the, the norms. The black part is the proportion of scientists who endorse the counter norms, so secrecy, hierarchy, um, and then some were unsure in the middle. Um, and um, the next two bars is now asking not what do you value, but how do you actually behave? And still most scientists say, yeah, my behavior is in line with the norms. Not many scientists are saying their behavior is in line with the counter norms. But the third set of bars, the bottom two bars, is asking now what about other scientists in your field? How do they behave? And now we see a very different picture. People say that the typical scientist does not behave in accordance with the norms and in fact much more frequently behaves in accordance with the counter norms. So, so this raises the question of is science really, are the scientific communities really committed to these norms? And are, if, if not, then are they really self-correcting? Because we talked about how these norms are so important for a culture of self-correction. Um, but these norms and the idea of these self-correcting mechanisms get raised a lot. And just on Twitter in the last few weeks, um, I encourage you to search on Twitter for the phrase self-correcting mechanisms or self-correction in science. It's, it's quite fun. Um, I've blacked out the identity of this person because I didn't ask for their permission to share their tweet, but it's an editor-in-chief of a major journal, high impact factor journal. And it was in a conversation about a problematic paper at another journal and people were debating whether that paper should be retracted. And they said retraction should be reserved for publication misconduct. Otherwise, let the self-correcting mechanisms of science take their course. And we often hear this, and I used to teach this in my undergraduate research methods class. I used to teach that science is self-correcting. And often when we talk about self-correction in science, it's as if it happens magically. Like if we just wait, things will self-correct. And this was captured really well in a tweet by James Heathers a few years back where he said, science is self-correcting, sure, when we correct it, not because of magical progress. And so what I've been asking myself is, what do these self-correcting mechanisms look like? How do we know if a scientific community really is committed to self-correction? And I think that's at the heart of what I've called the credibility revolution, a phrase I borrowed um, from other researchers, um, which is another kind of word for the replication crisis that's happened in my field of psychology. And I think what's at the heart of the credibility revolution is trying to change our norms and practices so that we actually carry out these self-correcting mechanisms that we preach about, that we say are the reasons why we should trust science. Um, and I think it really is at the core of why the public trusts science. Americans don't trust scientists because they think we're individually noble, but I think their trust in science has something to do with the idea that we're committed to as a community checking each other and correcting our mistakes. So what are the pillars of self-correction and of credibility? I'm going to argue that there are two. One is transparency and open science, and that encompasses a lot of different things. So things like open access to scientific outputs, open access to data and code underlying those results, um, openness and transparency in the peer review process, and many other things. Um, it also an important pillar of openness and transparency is a level playing field, making sure there are no barriers to entry, making sure that we're inclusive so that um, everybody can participate. But there's another pillar um, to the credibility revolution because transparency is necessary, but it's not sufficient for self-correction. So let me illustrate why. So if we have more transparency, that does increase the chances that there will be identifying mistakes and correcting mistakes and that we will earn more credibility. That's certainly one path that we could go if we are more transparent, we show all our work, people are like, oh, that's good, but over here you made a mistake and we fix it and people trust us more. But another possibility if we start showing all our work is that people will find many, many mistakes and mistakes that should not have been made, unforced errors, and that will actually lose credibility. So transparency doesn't guarantee credibility. Transparency just guarantees the credibility you deserve. And the difference between these two paths is just the difference in the quality of your methods, the quality of your work. So transparency is one necessary component for credibility, but it's not enough. 
you also need to be doing good work because if you transparently do poor quality work, you will not earn more credibility. This was articulated really well by Andrew Gelman in a paper he wrote called Honesty and Transparency Are Not Enough. And I'll just share a quote from that paper. He wrote, consider the practical consequences for a researcher who eagerly accepts the message of ethical and practical values of sharing and openness, but does not learn about the importance of data quality. He goes on, he or she could then just be driving very carefully and very efficiently into a brick wall, conducting transparent experiment after transparent experiment and continuing to produce and publish noise. So transparency is necessary, but it's not enough for credibility, for becoming a self-correcting science. The second part, the second pillar I'm gonna argue is something I'm calling quality control. It just means having high standards, making sure you're doing good, solid, rigorous research. So this is closest to the norm of organized skepticism that Merton talked about. Um, and it's the idea that we should be going in and checking each other's work. We shouldn't ask people to take our work at face value um, and it should be okay to question everything. So one metaphor I've used for these two pillars of openness and quality control is a metaphor of checking out a car, a used car before you buy it. So open science is saying, look, as a seller, you have to lift the, the lid. You have to show what's under the hood. Um, asking people to trust your scientific claims without showing them the underlying data and code and methods and so on is like asking them to buy your used car without looking under the hood. That's not a reasonable request. That's not what it means to be engaging in science. So we have to lift the hood, look under, make it possible for people to look under. One metaphor I like for this is giving your critics ammunition. You should be giving your critics everything they need to find the errors in your work, to find what's wrong with your work and fix it. But the second part of that is that we need people to actually come in and look under the hood and look for errors. So it's not enough to make the stuff available to give your critics ammunition. There also needs to be a community that rewards and incentivizes people going in and checking and verifying and correcting. So both of those are really important. And I think we talk a lot about open science and more and more, and that's great. And I'm glad we're making a lot of progress, but I'm gonna argue that the second part of that also needs a lot of attention. And that's the, the actually doing the criticism and correction. So now I'll talk a little bit about the empirical evidence on how we're doing on different indicators of these two pillars of self-correction, openness and transparency, and quality control. So my, the idea behind this part of the talk is that we shouldn't just be talking about these values. We need to actually um, implement them. We need to do them in a way that's measurable and visible. And then meta-scientists need to track them, need to say, how much does this scientific community engage in practices that enable self-correction? and track and compare over time, compare across scientific communities and so on, so that we have a way to evaluate scientific disciplines and communities and say which ones are more credible, more committed to self-correction than others, which ones are making progress, um, and so on. Okay, so on the transparency side of things, some indicators of a commitment to transparency are the frequency with which researchers share their data and code, share their materials, lab notebooks, procedures, etc. Pre-registers, so that's a form of transparency because pre-registration is writing down what you plan to do ahead of time. So you're letting other people see the order in which you made your decisions, the timing of those decisions, instead of just saying, trust me, I made this decision a priori, it was planned and so on. So those three have been really um, visible changes that have happened in psychology and some other fields as well. So I'm gonna show some data mostly from psychology, but some across social sciences on how um, how much we can quantify the change in these practices over the last decade or so. So first on open data. So it's for a long time now, it's been standard that when you publish in many psychology journals as an author, you sign something saying that you promise to share your data with other researchers who seek to verify your results. So some researchers all the way back in 2005, they contacted authors who had published papers in 2004 in journals that had this um, this requirement that authors promise to share their data with other researchers for verification purposes and asked for their data for verification purposes. And actually their project was meant to look at a question downstream from that. They wanted to get the data and then do something else with it. But they ended up publishing a paper just about the experience of trying to get the data from researchers who had published in a journal that required them to share the data upon request. And what they found was that the vast majority did not share the data for various reasons. So um, for 
11% share the data after the first request and another 16% share the data after a reminder. So overall a quarter or a little bit more than a quarter of the papers, the data were made available. 35% um, refused to share the data, 14% just didn't reply, and 20% promised the data but never delivered. Okay, so this was before the replication crisis and the credibility revolution. How have things changed? So these results are from a survey of social science scientists. So it's across several different disciplines, not just psychology. And these are self reports asking scientists to retrospectively report what was the first year that they remember engaging in various open science practices. So the bottom line is pre registration. So you can see fewer than 20% of the social scientists surveyed here. And these are people who got their PhDs prior to 2009. Um, about 20% in the latest year, 2017 were had pre-registered at least once and that was a fairly recent thing for most of those researchers but more of them 44 percent by 2017 had posted their methods materials study instruments and 73 percent had posted their data and you can see the tra trajectory at least according to their own memory of when they started doing that and um, 84 percent had done one at least one of these practices so we can see that this period of the last 15 years or so was one of a lot of growth among social scientists for these open practices. And another kind of openness I mentioned is pre-registration. So this is um, writing down in a time-stamped document that you make public later on what your plan is so that people can see if you deviated from your plan, which is important for interpreting the statistical results to make sure that it's not just a, a post hoc story you're telling about an unexpected finding. Um, which is okay to do, but not to present it as if it was planned. So letting the reader check what was planned and wasn't is really important for letting the reader decide for themselves if they think the result is really solid. So um, this is a graph showing what happened at a particular journal, Psychological Science, after they implemented just a simple nudge to try to get people to engage in this practice. Um, actually, no, this is not for pre-registration. I apologize. We're going to get to pre-registration in a second. This is for open data. So this journal, Psychological Science, actually offered badges for open data as well as pre-registration and open materials. But this graph just shows the proportion of authors who shared their data um, before and after this policy went into effect at the journal. So this journal is, in, is the black line. The red dotted line separates before versus after this badge policy went into effect. And the other gray lines, gray outlines, are other journals over the same period of time for a comparison point in the, similar, in the same field, psychology journals. So the y-axis only goes up to 40% here, but you can see that already within a couple of years of the badge going into effect, um, the proportion of authors sharing their data went from less than 10% to about 40%. What about pre-registration? So in a different um, survey looking at pre-registrations on the open science framework, um, the researchers found that the number of pre-registrations, cumulative number of pre-registrations from 2012 to 2018, went from base from zero to uh, over 18,000 pre-registrations by 2018. And a similar trend um, on a smaller scale is happening with journals offering something called registered reports. So registered reports is where you not only pre-register your plan, but you actually submit your paper with its pre-registration plan for peer review before you run the study. So you plan your study, you describe what you're going to do, you submit it to a journal, the journal sends that out for peer review. If it gets accepted, the journal is committing to publishing the paper regardless of the results, as long as you stick to the plan. Um, so the number of journals offering registered reports has gone up quite a bit. It was 120 in 2018. I think it's over 200 now. I'm not positive, but it has continued to grow. So we're doing pretty well on sharing data, sharing materials, pre-registration. Certainly the trends are um, fast change on those dimensions. What we know less about, or at least I couldn't find very much evidence about, is trends in terms of open access or posting preprints, um, open review, so making the peer review process more transparent. This is one that's near and dear to my heart as a journal editor and as an author. I feel that we really need to bring a lot more transparency and accountability to the peer review process. We let editors get away with too much. Um, removing the barriers to entry and making sure that there's a level playing field so that people from different backgrounds, different demographics, different geographical regions, different languages, et cetera, um, are able to participate fully in the scientific process. And declaring conflicts of interest, some fields do much better than others. Psychology is terrible on this front. 
And another kind of transparency is transparency about who did what. So moving away from an authorship model, which you earn authorship by being part of the writing, but science doesn't really work that way. A lot of people contribute important parts to the project that are different than the writing. And so we need a model not where not only we let those people be recognized for their work, but also we name who did what, who's responsible for what, and provide more transparency about the process in that way. So we need more meta science to track not only these things that we already are tracking, like open data and pre-registration, but also many other aspects of openness and transparency that are vital to credibility and self-correction. So moving on to the other kinds of indicators of credibility and a commitment to self-correction, quality control. So here, um, one obvious kind of quality control is detecting errors. And this is tough, but some kinds of error detection are really, really easy to do. So some um, researchers developed a tool to check for one very simple kind of error. Um, it's just whether the statistics reported in the paper are internally consistent, whether there's any contradiction in the statistical reports themselves. So not whether they're correct, we don't know whether they're correct or not, but just they don't have an internal contradiction. Um, so these researchers developed this tool called StatCheck, which can automatically scrape and extract statistical test results that are reported, as long as they're reported in APA style, the psychology format. And so they scraped a bunch of journals, um, eight psychology journals from 1985 to 2013, and they looked at what proportion of articles had at least one inconsistency. So this would be like a T value that doesn't match the degrees of freedom and P value. Um, and they found that almost 50% of articles had at least one inconsistency somewhere. And then they looked, okay, but how many of those actually change whether the result is significant or not? So it was reported as P less than 0.05, but if you recalculate the T value and the degrees of freedom, you actually get a non-significant result or vice versa. And they found that 13% had a gross inconsistency, as an inconsistency that affected whether the test statistic became significant or not. These are what I call unforced errors. This is something that you just need to double or triple check to avoid making this error. And the gross inconsistency is one that you really need to get right, especially given how much we valorize statistical significance, which is a problem for another day. Um, so there are more and more tools like this being developed to detect these easy to detect errors, these low hanging fruit, implausible results that just are um, inconsistent with other facts within the same paper which is just the easy stuff to detect. There's a lot more kinds of errors that are harder to detect, um, but there's a lot more work to be done in error detection. And some people are really rising to this challenge of wanting to give their critics ammunition, wanting to find out where the errors are in their paper. One very recent example of this is Nicholas Coles, who literally paid other researchers to find errors in his work. So this is called the red team approach. So he put $3,000 towards incentivizing people to find errors in his work. This was a project he'd already completed. He'd written up the manuscript before submitting it to a journal. He asked a team of, of critical scientists to try to find errors in his work. Now, ideally, we would find the errors before the study is run. So some of, in this case, some of the errors that were found were designs, design problems with the study, which he couldn't easily go and fix. He would have to run a new study. So this is where the registered report model really shines. It provides authors feedback and, and error detection before they run the study so that they have time to fix aspects of the design that can be improved. So registered reports, as I mentioned before, is where the authors develop their idea, design their study, write up their paper about what they plan to do, submit it to a journal, get peer reviewed, and then collect and analyze the data, write up the results, and it gets published after that. So this is a, a really proactive kind of prophylactic approach to error detection, detecting the errors before you collect the data so that you have time to fix them. There's also tools for bias detection, which is where you could take a set of published literature and ask, does this look like an unbiased set of results? So meta-analysis is supposed to do that. We've recently learned that our, well, some people knew it for a long time, but it's become more um, well known that many popular meta-analytic techniques actually don't control for bias in the literature. And one of the big new ways of thinking about and detecting bias has to do with the distribution of p-values in the literature, and I don't have time to go into detail, but the idea is that when findings are unbiased, when they're true positive results, um, the curve of the p-values, the shape of the distribution of p-values in that literature should be extremely right skewed. Most p-values should be very close to zero, and very few p-values should be around 0 0.03, 0 0.04, or 0 0.05, 0 0.06. 
So we can, one way to get at how much bias there is in the literature is looking at how much the curve of p-values does not match this unbiased curve. Another important aspect of an efficient quality control system, a scientific community that really wants to catch errors and fix them, is the diversity of that community. It's really important that that community include people from different backgrounds with different viewpoints, different values, different experiences, and who will detect different kinds of problems and biases. And this was captured well um, in Naomi Oreskes's book, Why Trust Science, especially in the part where she was describing the philosopher of science, Helen Longino's approach to, to her view of how to make science robust. Um, and so she's describing Helen Longino's work and she says, the greater the diversity and openness of a community and the stronger its protocols for supporting free and open debate, the greater the degree of objectivity it may be able to achieve as individual biases and background assumptions are outed, as it were, by the community. So the idea is that if everyone has the same assumptions coming in, we're not gonna catch each other's mistakes. So you really want a diverse group who are gonna come at the, the research with different assumptions, different biases, different blind spots. So this is a dimension that we can also evaluate a field on. How is it doing in terms of making sure people with these different backgrounds, assumptions, and biases are part of the community? Another form of quality control is testing whether the work that's published and that we rely on is reproducible. And I'm using reproducible here to mean if I use the exact same data that the authors collected and analyze it again, do I get the exact same results? So just one example of a test of reproducibility, Tom Hardwick and his colleagues took the opportunity when a journal changed its policy to require authors to post their data. So not just to say, make it available upon request, but actually post your data with, along with the paper. So the data were now all there with all published papers. So Tom Hardwick and his colleagues went in and took 38 papers published in that journal after they required data posting and tried to reproduce the analyses in that paper. It took a really, really long time. He gives a great talk about this project. Um, I just have one summary slide from the project. So they categorized the papers into whether they were able to reproduce all of the results easily without assistance from the original authors, were able to reproduce all the results after getting assistance from the original authors, or were not able to re reproduce all of the results even after assistance from the original authors. And this is what happens, and this is a journal, again, I'll remind you, these were authors who knew that they would have to post their data, they did post their data. So presumably, if anything, they were more careful to make sure their data could um, produce the results in their paper. But only about a third of them were reproducible without author assistance. Another third, roughly a little less, were reproducible with assistance from the authors, and then a little more than a third were not fully reproducible despite author assistance. Um, so again, I think this, the results for this particular journal and this particular set of studies is actually probably too rosy because when authors know they don't have to post their data, they might put less work into make sure, making sure that their results are reproducible. So we have a lot of room for improvement here. What about replicability? So this is where we don't use the author's data, we go and collect our own data. We replicate the experiment anew, collect new data, analyze it, see if we can get the same result that the original authors got or a similar one. Now, I don't have time to go into this and Brian will give a talk entirely on replicability. So I'm just gonna very quickly summarize the results of a number of replication projects where the authors went out and replicated original studies in the social sciences. And these are all projects that had quite high standards for the replications, much larger sample size. Almost In almost all cases, the replication had a much larger sample size than the original, was pre-registered. There was a lot of, of careful um, precautions taken. And despite that, only 92 out of 199 of the effects were successfully replicated. So it's a 46% replication rate, which means 54%, and I would put plus or minus 15% or something around that estimate. Um, might be false positives. So this also leaves a lot of room, right? This is not ideal for our top journals. Many of these are replications of studies published in top journals. So we have a lot of room for improvement, but this is the kind of data that MetaScience can produce to tell us, okay, are we doing okay on this aspect of quality control? Another important aspect of a community that values self-correction and quality control is making sure that there's a way for negative results to get out there, whether those are replication studies that failed or just a new idea uh, that was a hot topic and was tested and it produced a null result. So we know from several different studies, and I'll, I'll skip the details, but we know from several different studies that 
many sciences publish very, very few null results. It's not uncommon for journals to be just full of 80%, 90% positive significant results. And that's definitely true for psychology. Um, I won't explain this graph, but basically over 90% of articles published in psychology journals report positive or significant results. That can't be accurate. There's just no way that we're right 90 plus percent of the time and that our studies are so high powered that we always detect that true significant effect that's there. So what I'm going to show you next is what happens when we remove a lot of the bias that leads to this um, overabundance of positive results. And that's what registered reports can do. Because remember, with registered reports, the journal agrees to publish the result no matter how it comes out. They approve the protocol. They like the idea. They like the design of the study. They think it's rigorous. They think we'll learn something no matter what happens. So the journal promises to publish it regardless of what happens. So that removes a lot of the bias on the part of the journal. And the authors also have to follow the protocol, which includes an analysis plan and so on. So there's not a lot of room for the authors to eke out a significant result either. So the bias on both sides is greatly reduced. So what proportion of registered report results are significant results? So a couple of different projects have estimated this based on the now the small but growing number of registered reports that have been published. So first we see that in the general literature, something like 5 to 20 percent of results are significant. That's what I just showed you before in psychology. It's about 5 or 10 percent of traditional articles, not registered reports, but just regular articles have null results, so very rare. Among registered reports, it's 55 to 65% of the results are null results, and about 55% for new studies and 65, 66% for replication studies. Another project looking at a slightly different set of registered reports came to a similar conclusion. So first they looked at the traditional literature, again found over 90% of those claimed to have found significant results. And then in the registered reports literature where bias is greatly reduced, it was less than 50% had significant results. So again, it's a healthy science is one that allows these negative results to get out there. It doesn't hide them away or force the authors or the, the, the science to turn them into positive, newsworthy, flashy results. Um, and then another aspect of a healthy science is to have mechanisms for post-publication peer review. So this means that even after something has a seal of approval of the top journal, even after it's made the rounds in the news, et cetera, there is an opportunity to correct it if it's wrong. And this is really, really tough. There's really not much glory in this. As Kurt Vonnegut said, another flaw in the human character is that everybody wants to build and nobody wants to do maintenance. And I think psychology in the last 10 years has shown that not only is there very little incentive and appetite for doing this work, but we actually impose a cost and a disincentive on doing it. And here are just a few of the names that people doing this kind of work have been called in psychology. Um, these are well-documented insults that have been slung, although actually accuracy fetishists, I'm not sure where it came from. That's one of my favorites. Um, but there's a lot of downside to being one of the people that does post-publication review, that criticizes published work, that does replications, and so on. So we really need to change that. If we're going to find errors, then we need to incentivize and reward and thank and be grateful for the people who actually find and correct those errors. Um, and in fact, there's a lot of, of cases where that's our job is to evaluate work after it's been published. When we hire people, when we promote people, we have to decide if their body of work that's already been through peer review is solid, high quality work that represents the kind of work we want to hire into our departments. And the SF DORA, the Declaration on Research Assessment, is about making sure that the evaluations in those contexts, in those high stakes contexts, are not based on bad metrics like journal impact factor, but actually on the quality of the work. So that means we need a way to identify flaws, even in published work. We're often in a situation where we have to decide, is this work that's been through peer review, is it really good, high quality work? My own university, University of Melbourne, has recently signed DORA. So the question is, what do we do? How do we do a post-publication evaluation of work, identify how solid it is, identify flaws? And Dora itself tweeted recently that one of the main, three main themes that runs through Dora is the need to assess research on its own merits. But there's very little guideline on how to do this. And as I mentioned, very little reward, and in fact, a lot of punishment for actually trying to scrutinize and assess published work on its own merits. Thanks to some funding from Fetzer, my graduate students and I are working on 
a, a rubric to try to evaluate flaws in published work. So we're, because we work in social and personality psychology, we think about things like construct validity, statistical validity, internal validity, and external validity. So we're working on this rubric. Sarah Schiavone is the main person behind this. And we're trying to validate the rubric and see if this helps structure post-publication peer review and provide quantitative metrics of the quality of published work. So I've talked about um, openness, transparency, and quality control as two of the pillars of credibility and self-correction. And I also think that's the answer to the question, where are these mysterious self-correcting mechanisms in science that we keep talking about? They're not magic. This is what they look like. They look like openness, open data, um, open access to publications, openness in the review process. They look like detecting errors, correcting them, making sure things are reproducible, replicable, making sure there's a diversity of voices in the criticism process, publishing null results, et cetera. So in her book, Why Trust Science, Naomi Oreska says that when we observe scientists, we find that they have developed a variety of practices for vetting knowledge, for identifying problems in their theories and experiments and attempting to correct them. And that sounds really nice and I hope that's true, but the truth is we don't actually know. And I would argue that as scientists, we need to stop telling the public, trust us, we have these self-correcting mechanisms in place and we need to start making them visible. We need to start being able to point to and quantify to what extent do we have these self-correcting mechanisms in place? And in fact, James Heathers, who has done a lot of this correction himself, um, has said, in reality, the mechanisms to correct bad science are slow, unreliably enforced, capricious, run with only the barest nod towards formal policy, confer no reward, and sometimes punitive elements for a complainant who might use them. It's time to start actually measuring and looking for these self-correcting mechanisms. And I think we need to look for them in both categories of transparency and openness and quality control. Thank you. <laughs>